if it's not succeeding on Amazon because you haven't figured out how to really capture market share, or you don't know if this product is a product market fit, maybe you just had a great idea for a product, but the demand wasn't there. The demand isn't necessarily going to be there on Walmart, likely is not going to be there. If you're struggling because you, you launched a Me Too product that had no differentiation, maybe you'll get it there. If you haven't proven serious sales volume in the past, right. you may not even get on the platform. The Ron Hirschkorn here, your host of the e-commerce mindset podcast. In this episode, I talked to Ryan King, who is the CEO of Blue Rise, a full service agency focused on walmart.com, as well as Daniel Solid, who is a seven figure seller and also co-founder and president of Blue Rise. We talk all about Walmart, their experience with it. They're in it day to day, as well as should you be selling there? How do you grow your sales there? Uh, so I think you'll find this podcast interesting, whether you're selling on Walmart or are considering selling on Walmart. The podcast, as always, is sponsored by Incrementum Digital. We've been helping brands grow their sales, lower their tacos. You can read some of our recent reviews on Trustpilot. Uh, just Google Incrementum Digital and Trustpilot or check out the website incrementumdigital.com, as well as doing really great creative work, listing optimization work that you can see work examples on our site as well. You can visit incrementumdigital.com to learn more. The podcast is also sponsored by 8Fig. 8Fig is your best flexible solution for growth capital for your e-commerce business. It's not just growth capital, but it's growth capital that has a lot of flexibility. If you have shipments that are delayed, the payments are very flexible and you can also increase the availability as your business grows. You can check out 8Fig.co to learn more about getting Getting growth capital from 8Fig. Enjoy this podcast episode. Okay, so we have with us on the podcast, Daniel Solid and Ryan King. Daniel is a longtime e-commerce seller, has been selling in e-commerce since 2013, multiple seven-figure brands selling on Amazon and Walmart, and is president of Blue Rise, which we'll talk more about. Ryan King is a former pastor and the CEO of Blue Rise and has been in the e-commerce space for the last six years. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Liron. Great to be here. So, Super excited to be here. Thank you. My first question is, how, how do you go from pastor to, to e-commerce? Great question. The, the simple explanation, kind of a lot of what I was doing was involved in, I guess, it, from the nonprofit space kind of perspective in a lot of relief and development, those kind of things. And one of the things I saw in that space was, you know, sustainable employment and, and just revenue generation was one of the, the things often a symptom of, or a cause maybe of some of the conditions around the world and some, and definitely some developing locations. And so e-commerce early on when I was, I was seeing what are some maybe transferable models that you could train someone in around the world that, that isn't geo-specific, that is virtual by nature. E-commerce kind of was starting to a little bit more. Amazon has that model, FBA, those things, and thought, man, this would be a great thing to experiment with. And then as I just experimented on that side, got the itch for realizing actually a lot of what I do is kind of the entrepreneurial, figure out this, the problem, find the gap, loved getting to do it. And that's kind of part of why Blue Rise exists, trying to figure out how do we, how do we both provide value to clients and brands, but also how do we do that when we're able to produce models for others to repeat elsewhere that they could scale up their own teams and do things around the world. So we, we love experimenting in that way. And that's kind of that, the transition. Cool. So what was the main kind of motivation to start a Walmart based, let's say agency, you know, it's, I, I guess, let, let's say it's not the po most popular type of e-commerce agency, considering it's one of the channels that, you know, doesn't have the same sales volume as, you know, let's say people selling on Shopify or, or Amazon. What, what was, what was the reasoning starting a, a Walmart agency? We were having conversations with some guys that used to work at Walmart and senior leadership there. And it was actually during COVID, I, I had this call with like the C-level guys at Walmart and they were just trying to learn more about, like we have a little round table of CEOs that run e-commerce companies here in Atlanta. And, and we were just realizing like, man, we, we don't know a lot about retail. These guys know a lot about retail, but man, the Amazon community knows a lot about e-commerce and they're trying to bring the two together. And so there was a push that they made us aware of where like, they were like, we, we want to start making our buying decisions in the future based on e-commerce data on our website. And so we're telling all of our buyers, you know, they rotate the buyers every three years at Walmart so that they don't get like nepotistic and like getting bribes and stuff. Right. And so a lot of times these buyers just don't know 
like their category very well. And so to be able to lean on the data for e-commerce, they were like, we're, we're requiring our buyers now to really push .com here at Walmart. So we were made aware of that. And then Ryan and I were talking about what he was just speaking to as far as like, we want our vision is to transform communities globally through our work in e-commerce. And so we're turning the profits back into, you know, community transformation in, in impoverished parts of the world. And so that's why we do what we do. And then the third thing was just realizing like Walmart right now is the Amazon of 2015, 16, where we're allowed to do stuff there. It's a blue ocean. It's not a red ocean that right. we were allowed to do on Walmart, on Amazon back then, but we're not allowed to anymore. Things like, you know, incentivize reviews and, you know, putting some stuff in our primary image to get more clicks. And right. there's just not the competition either. And so just seeing that, man, there's a window of opportunity. And so when, when we tell people we've got an agency that just does Walmart, people raise their eyebrows and go, well, we haven't encountered that. How does that work? Right. And I think Ryan's done a great job leading the company and really building like a brand assessment out that says, hey, this is a fit or it's not a fit for you. It's not for, depending on where your company's at, where your market space is at, it could be the time or it could not. But we've we've seen success focusing here particularly given the blue ocean nature of the platform. Right. So you mentioned a few things I want to dive further into. One, you know, which which company's products, when when is a good time to, to get into it? I mentioned another thing about reviews, incentivized reviews, and what are some of the things, you know, that sellers can do today that just like Amazon, where you could do incentivized reviews, eventually they they took it away. And then also we talked a little bit about going from dot walmart.com to to retail, right? So let's let's talk a little bit first about when should somebody who has, you know, an Amazon is an Amazon seller, let's say most of their revenue is coming from from Amazon, when should they consider getting onto Walmart? And would you say there's any categories you would say that are not good or types of products, categories that you would not recommend to go on Walmart. And actually right before this, this recording of the podcast, there was a brand that I know that sells into that they recently launched like three, maybe three, four months ago with a nighttime cookie. Okay. So it's basically like a healthier cookie that I think also has like melatonin or whatever. Right. So it's kind of like as a kid, you, you maybe had a glass of milk and like a chocolate chip cookie. So they developed like, you know, like some, sugar-free version with melatonin and, and certain things, right? Kind of like for adults. And he asked a question of, you know, when, when, you know, we've been in business like three months, when would be a good time to consider going into retail? And one of the, one of the recommendations somebody made there is, Hey, you should go on walmart.com because the buyers are kind of looking at, looking at the, the data, you know, that was like just looking at that right before, you know, we came, came out here to talk about Walmart. Gotcha. Well, yeah, th those are great questions. I'll try and try and tackle through those yeah, without getting let's, too let's far into the weeds. With, but. Let's start with the products or categories that you, let's say, wouldn't recommend and maybe at which point should somebody consider adding a channel. Yeah. So I would, I'll, you know, from the company standpoint, I'd probably say what we've said and what we've seen most success with is if your primary revenue channel is Amazon, one good benchmark, and I can go into the whys a little bit more, but the one good benchmark is probably if you're doing seven figures or more, that's the point of it, at which it makes sense to start thinking about moving into another marketplace, diversifying your revenue, and Walmart might be a good option to do that. Some of the reasons are because Walmart's probably not going to be an instant short-term ROI at the model you're used to seeing at Amazon when we're talking online sales. And so if you need that cash flow right up front from the return on that investment, then you're probably best investing that, continue to expand on Amazon. If you're looking for more of a strategic play for midterm, long-term, that's probably where the marketplace is right now on Walmart. Is, and so is Walmart, uh, not a, let's say immediate ROI because, because you need to sell unprofitably to build up reviews or like, what are the main reasons? Because, you know, Amazon is no longer also an immediate ROI, right? Too, right? That's true. So, true. But I would think yeah. Walmart could be easier and maybe less volume, but easier in the sense, because less competition, et cetera. So what are the reasons why Walmart, we know about Amazon, right? It's very competitive. Right. Yeah, I'd say, what about Walmart? Yeah. Sorry for stepping on either. Yeah. The, I'd say all things the same. Um, it is easier probably to rank. Again, there's some caveats there, depending on if you're competing against in-store offering those things. It can be easier to rank, lower review threshold, all those things on Walmart. 
However, the time invested to learn the ins and outs of the Walmart platform in order to do that effectively is more difficult. And so if you're going to invest that time, whether it's opportunity cost of time invested or hiring. those kind of things or hiring or any of those things, what we would say is on average, we see probably about four to 12% of the revenue of an Amazon brand on Walmart right now. And so when you're considering what can I do to gain that extra four to 10%, whatever it might be, there might be a lot of other levers to pull on Amazon still right. before you get to the point of saying, let's go to another marketplace where the rules are a bit different. Challenges might be different. The platform works, it operates differently, all those things. And so, but once you get to that seven figures, you might have the internal decision to say, yeah, that makes sense. And you might either internalize it or, or partner with somebody to do so. That might be a reason. Another reason is to get onto Walmart right now. They're probably looking at, they've made application to the marketplace much easier mm -hmm. than they had in the past. But that said, they're really looking for sales history. They want experienced sellers that can offer good customer support, legitimate product offering, all those things. So you're probably looking at minimum six months of sales history. I'd probably say a minimum six, six figures in revenue to be there. There's no clear cut criteria right. in that way, but that, that ups your chances. So for those reasons, more established brand over a period of time, if you're looking just for the e-commerce side. We can talk about later if you'd like as well. Uh, you know, if your goal is different, if your goal is into retail distribution as part of your model as a business, there might be other goals and other reasons to go earlier. Right. But that said, Walmart buyers still look at Amazon stats too. Right. So that that can be done either way. But that's one of the things. And how important would you say is like with Amazon utilizing FBA and getting that prime badge, unless you're in a product that's too heavy or whatever, right? Is, is kind of like critical to success or really important, I would say, even though you could still sell, you just convert less, but not really well. What about on Walmart? Like, what are you seeing as far as, you know, how important is it to have that, you know, filled by Walmart? And Walmart fast fulfillment point? services. Yeah. 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 Pretty important. At, at first, you know, two years ago, 18 months ago, it was maybe your competitive edge as first mover advantage and can right. differentiate yourself and you can start getting sales by doing it. Now it's more table stakes. 60 to 80% of the products on Walmart now are, are utilizing WFS and getting two to three day shipping, sometimes one day shipping there. So Walmart would say, you know, for a good number of brands, when they utilize WFS and get the W plus badge, what they're saying publicly is you can you can see a fifty percent increase in GMV for doing that. I would just and say we've the seen that with a couple of clients too, yeah. where like we've moved them from doing their own fulfillment to WFS and seen maybe not fifty, but I mean definitely there was that one brand we saw forty percent growth on on the SKUs that we did. Okay. If it's the right category, which I know we'll talk about it in a second. Right. Right. I'd say. One other thing I'd say is, is if you're fulfilling and you're asking if a brand is saying, well, I, I've heard I can fulfill from Amazon. So why would I move it over to WFS? WFS is Walmart Fulfillment Services, what they call the equivalent. Pricing is about equivalent, everything, give or take. Lighter products might be a little more expensive on Walmart right now than others. There is word out there. People do recommend, and I've even heard from clients kind of horror stories of agencies on Amazon saying, yes, do FBA, fulfill, fulfill your order from Walmart via Amazon FBA with an unmarked box, those kind of things. That is a violation of Walmart terms of services. And that is that will result in account termination. And there's there's really almost zero coming back from that. Even with firms that specialize in reinstatement, that is the one hard one to come back from. So I would say if you're doing that right now, if you hear this, stop. Figure out another solution. Don't do that anymore because if even if you haven't been caught yet, it will happen and that'll basically effectively end your third party marketplace. Got it. So Ryan what, one other thing too on the high level would just be like where you need to be incorporated to to, to even open an account on Walmart. Okay. Sure. Yeah, U.S. based entity primarily. So uh, whether you're a U.S. company or you have your W eight as a, a tax identifier in the U.S. has been primarily the entities that can sell in Walmart. If not that, they've opened it up now to the U.K. for sellers as well as Canada. And so if you're in one of those air regions and you want to know more about it, you can simply Google probably Wal selling on Walmart Canada or, in, or from the UK and there'll be announcements there from them. And and they're opening up other countries, right? Like I think I just saw this week, they're opening up China and other countries. I mean, do we think it's going to go the way of Amazon with, you know, a lot of Chinese sellers, a lot of, a lot of competition? What's, I mean, it doesn't seem like Walmart is taking this stance, you know, to, to focus more on US-based sellers. Yeah, so it's a bit, there's some historical narrative there as far as they did 
early on when Amazon purged kind of a lot of sellers, they're bad right. actors. Walmart wasn't yet at a point where they had filters to keep them from coming over. Right. And so Walmart got deluged with, with bad actors. And then their reaction was let's, let's crank down the filters heavy and limit who comes on right. until we figure this out. And so now they're in a period of easing that back open a bit more. Mm -hmm. So you're going to still see a lot of the, the, the stuff that's happening that we, you know, back to selling 2016 on Amazon that we were used to seeing there. It's going to happen to a degree, brand protection, those kind of things. We have seen some success in doing that, but yeah, there are a lot more sellers internationally on the platform and it's increasing in volume by percentage. I think 50% of the, the sellers in August or September of new sellers to Walmart marketplace were from China in that example. So it's growing significantly. Whether or not that's going to affect kind of the rules of the game, so to speak, on the marketplace right. is another thing to be seen. But yeah, got it. And and in terms of in terms of the you mentioned before a little bit about incentivized reviews. So I know there's a few different platforms out there that can kind of help with that. What are you know? What do you recommend? Also, is there a particular recommendation as far as like how how aggressive should you be with that, and or how aggressive you can be with the amount of incentivized reviews that you try to go get? Yeah, so kind of clarifying what do we mean? Because there's a lot of ways you can do incentivized reviews, whether, you know, everybody from their Facebook groups to anything else, you know, there's been a lot of, a lot right. of conversation around that. So if we're talking about incentivized in Walmart ecosystem, what is allowable? So an incentivized review, if you're on Amazon, that's like, man, right. they shut down hard, that's going to shut you down. Right. Uh, on Walmart, it's okay, meaning... There are white, completely legitimate, endorsed, incentivized review programs that Walmart works with. Bizarre Voice is one of those. So Bizarre Voice has what they would call their Spark reviewer program would be co comparable to Vine Voice. Mm -hmm. And so you can sample through them, get reviews. Those will show up as incentivized. Another one that's less known because they've been more in the retail space, those things is a group called Field Agent. And you can find them at fieldagent.net. Um, they are also another white labeled partner or not white labeled white hat partner with Walmart. And you can get reviews whether or not you're in store, if you're in store, or if you're just online, you can get the purchase, leave a review online type of thing there. And that's, that's probably the field agent one we use the most. And that's usually about $15 per product plus the cost of reimbursement of the product. They probably have an average from our experience around 4.3 uh, on average across all things, 4.3 rating on those reviews. So it's a good one. You'll get the incentivized review tag on there, those things, but it's perfectly legitimate. Are you seeing, some, are you seeing some brands, let's say in the, let's say, especially competitive categories where they're going on and getting a thousand incentivized reviews or, because, you know, if you think back to Amazon and the days where you could do that, you would say, Hey, you know, in hindsight, I should have done a lot more while, while I could. So mm -hmm. I'm sure there's those Amazon sellers that are coming onto Walmart, maybe with that mindset, like, what are you seeing in terms of those brands that have the cash flow on Amazon to kind of take and invest into those, those reviews on, on Walmart in terms of like quantity? Yeah. So, you know, right now the review moat around a lot of products is really low. So last time I looked Bluetooth earbuds on Amazon was something like average review count on page one, it was 40,000 average review count on Walmart page one was 800. Right. And so if you just look at it from that bar saying, okay, I only need three, 400 to compare to this 800 maybe and get in striking distance. I would argue that for some brands, if you're in a highly competitive area to think ahead of right. where it's going right. and start building now and get ahead of the curve if you can, because yeah, these programs will probably decrease over time. Walmart is looking for, they want a good shopper experience. So they know social proof is key. They're trying to up those numbers in a, right. in a legitimate way across the marketplace. As soon as they start finding that equilibrium, you can probably, we've seen this roadmap before. Right. It's going to, those offerings will decrease. The third thing I've mentioned though on this reviews, if it's either incentivized through generating new reviews that way, the other way is if you already are working with Bizarre Voice or Yapo or Power Reviews on your own D2C website, you can through any of those companies in contract with them, have your reviews syndicated automatically over to Walmart. So that's something to look for. We've talked with people that have been with Yapo and didn't even know that was part of the option. And all they had to do under their current contract was ask for it to be turned on. And so that's one thing to look at. If you're not one of those three, there is a fourth way, which is if you have legitimate reviews on your own D2C site and you're not with one of those other three, you can apply at a brand level with Walmart to have your reviews uploaded via CSV. 
And so there's a portal. We can give you give you the link later for your notes or something mm -hmm. on the show. Portal, you can apply as a brand. And then if you're accepted at the brand level and you fit their criteria, you basically bulk upload a CSV to their team and those will be processed and up on your listings. So that's another opportunity to take right now that we did. We, sure. we just don't think, I mean, it's going to last. I mean, right. they're, they're wanting to get the reviews now. You can go right. ahead and vote now. And, I mean, and that's why if you're on the fence, it might be worth stepping into the marketplace just because, yeah, you may may not see profitability for a little while just because of the low volume compared right. to Amazon, but you're building a moat <laughs> against competitors for maybe next year when we're not allowed to do this anymore. Right. Yeah. And yeah, and if we see the playbook Walmart's, you know, utilizing, you know, they launch first, kind of more limited to US people. Then they started to add Walmart fulfillment services. Then they opened it up to more sellers. They're allowing incentivized reviews. I mean, it's the exact same roadmap. Yeah. And there's also a lot of Amazon execs, right? Who left Amazon to go to, right. to go to Walmart. So um, sure, it's the same playbook that that Amazon kind of went through. And there's a purpose behind it. And they're not gonna they're not gonna let it they're not gonna let these programs run forever. Yeah. Just, yeah. This is Daniel's theory here. Yep. I, I do, as an ethos in the company, they actually value relationship with the sellers more. Like we actually get to talk to people in the categories mm -hmm. and make decisions and develop relationships. So they're much more relational. You know how you're just not allowed to make friends at Amazon really right. unless it's under the table because they intentionally, you're just not allowed to talk to decision makers. It's been a little different at Walmart. Now, on the other side, you know, they, they don't have the systems that are as strong. So things are constantly breaking and we're having to, we just do a lot of problem solving for our clients to get basic what? things like variations working. But in talking with their C-level guys, they really are pretty pro-America, like culturally. Like, right. So I was, so, you know, that was kind of my initial, like referencing that, you know, you thought maybe Walmart would be, you know, more, yeah, pro-America, lim limiting to the, you know, outside countries or Chinese sellers, things like that. Um, right. And so that remains to be seen how they're going to go. But I know there's a lot of internal pull towards let's prioritize American companies. Walmart the, customers too, right? Like, yes. Think about that kind of more patriotic, conservative type, you know, yep. maybe maybe type type shopper. That's uh, right. Yeah. From kind of what, what I, you know, what I think of. In talking to, you know, because you have you're you know, you're selling there, you have an agency there, you're talking to you're talking to Walmart. Are they are they giving you indication of like, okay, well, what are they doing to or how are they going to kind of grow market share against Amazon or like, you know, what 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 is their plan to have sellers go from you know five percent to fifteen percent of of sales, you know, Walmart versus Amazon? Like are they are they sharing any you know, ideas on how they're going to take market share? I, you know, I, I don't know. I haven't, haven't been granted the, the, the roadmap there in some ways, but you can get some inference from, you know, whether it's, it's probably not, I, I wouldn't say I have a, a, a connection that's giving me the inside scoop per se, but, you know, listening to earnings calls, looking at what they're doing on the, on the marketplace, other things. I think some of the strategies are, you know, obviously they rolled out W plus program, similar to a prime in some ways that they've been rolling in value to. So they're really pushing heavy behind that as a program to incentivize loyalty in shoppers and bring people over. One of the interesting things uh, as a impact of the recession or inflation as well is I think it was that Q3 report was their their highest percentage of growth in new shoppers was in net net income families of 100,000 or more. And so they were getting a different demographic coming to the website during that time because they're buying their staples for grocery. And that was what they were buying primarily. Right. But we'll see, you know, taking advantage of those cost savings on staples to capture a higher demographic and, 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 and dispensable, disposable income. And then yeah. we'll see, can they keep it sticky over time to where that becomes the experience where shoppers stick around and they see value there. Yeah. That's one. I think the, the, the goal has been more sellers, more assortment and higher quality on the assortment to get more eyeballs from shoppers has been another big one. And that's a big push. They want the and that's similar purchase. to Amazon, right, Ryan? I mean, yeah. and, and so far, like you're right, Leron, the, the path has been similar to Amazon. Right. Now, I think one thing that they're going to do a little differently, and this was, you know, so I had a, I had a conversation with them a little while back, but what they've been doing with their C-level guys, but 
what I've been hearing and seeing is a real emphasis on their supply chain capacity, right? And so there's a reason they get so upset when you try to fulfill your product from Amazon. They want you using their supply chain. And, and well, they, yeah, I mean, that, look, it's totally understandable, right? Like, yeah. uh, you know, if I'm Nike, do I want my customers, you know, to get, you know, Adidas uh, packaging? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. No. Like, there's that but see they have the one of the largest refrigerated goods networks in the world and so i think the, the direction they're going and i've had guys indicate this to me is to be much better than amazon at delivering perishable goods to the front mm -hmm. door and to provide a way for 3p guys to also do that you know and, and there's a lot of 1p programs that are easier to get into than than in store as well that are already doing that and so you're looking at yes you know, the ability to pick up goods at Walmart that would be really expensive to ship via WFS or FBA mm -hmm. uh, that you're able to offer a lower price point on because you're leveraging their supply chain to get it there at a lower cost. I mean, you, yeah. we're all watching our costs go up on, on FBA fees. Right. And it's getting, it's getting border, borderline ridiculous. So for some of these products that are larger, I, I think, and, and refrigerated, I think we're going to see Walmart as a viable way to get it to the customer with more profit. Right. Like I'm buying a couch or something, right. And I can go, I can go pick it up or, or right. you know, buy it online, pick it up, pick it up. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're also, and they've already been deploying this, but utilizing, you know, the, the number, the stat gets thrown out there a lot, but it, they're, I don't know the exact percentage of it's, you know, they're within 10 to 15 minutes of over 90% of the population in the U S with their super centers right. and stores. And they are converting space in those stores and a lot of those stores and piloting this out into e-commerce fulfillment space. Mm -hmm. And so you can see where they're going, where the puck is going on that. If you want to use a hockey illustration, but right. on getting that last mile delivery within 10 to 15 minutes of 90% of the population of the U S at least, which is still one of the largest markets. Right. Um, they're they're going there logistically, I think. So that attracts more sellers, attracts more yeah. shoppers. The so they're they're moving thing, in a lot of ways. Yeah. The last thing is they're go, they're going there from an ad standpoint too. They they want to provide even three Ps with third party sellers with the ability to run ads in store to to customers. Mm -hmm. And so you know there's 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 places and placements that we can that they want us to be able to for in person touches aside from just so, on the site. So you're selling on walmart.com, but you have an in-store in-store ad for your product. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. That's something they're they've mentioned that they're 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 experimenting with internally. So yeah. Right. And if, if you yeah. if you would say there's an advantage for Walmart, right? That's going to be the the, the advantage is going to be that 10, 15 minutes from 90% of you know US US households, right? If if there is yeah, a, yeah. any let's say advantage over, you know, over, over, over Amazon yeah. in terms of, in terms of logistics, what do you see in terms of, in terms of the launch process? Is it pretty similar to Amazon where, where it's, you know, algorithmically, if you, if you launch strong, great velocity, you get more traction, more ranking, you know, what, what does it, what does it look like in terms? I mean, I'm assuming just in general, sales velocity conversions, right? Help you, help you rank, but is, is it pretty similar? Are people doing like, you know, URL kind of ranking initiatives, keyword embedded stuff, like kind of like, you, you know, say you used to do more of or, or, or deep discount coupons, things like that giveaways for, for launch purposes. Yeah. Great question. So it is, there's a couple things. So, you know, whether it's the PPC strategy of I'm just going to spin my way to the top and get things moving with a low price and come high PPC keyword relevancy and how to operate with PPC is a major factor. And so what that effectively means is for, for some of the highest value keywords, relying on something like PPC alone to rank may not work. If you're, if you start off on page four and organic or below that, um, even if you're bidding quadruple the the cost of the click right. the algorithm may not give it to you ever right. and so now that that caused a lot of people to lose their shirts before they went to a second bid auction last august right. because walmart effectively would gladly take your four dollar bid mm -hmm. to put you in position 100 in in the the uh, sponsored placement but the but ppc has to be done along with organic signals so we do see the algorithm reward conversion and interest as demonstrated by just click through and add to cart even. Right. And that's, that's, that's the same on Amazon. You know, you're probably getting up to page two at least is influenced at least probably some add to cart behavior because that's what's happening before they're converting 
for anybody and do beyond you, page do you one. offer like a launch you know sort of process when when somebody's going on amazon does that include things like giveaways the uh, things that are you know still considered okay on the on the walmart side so whether it's we as part of what we do in managing if it's a new or, brand or the question to is, the does, market does walmart consider it okay yeah giveaways as far as if you're trying to manipulate you know, Walmart, just like Amazon would say, if you're trying to manipulate the algorithm, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. But if there's programs, whether it is, you know, the, the, the secondary effect of doing a, re a review, incentivized review program with a field agent or something like that, where someone's purchasing online, leaving review online, the impact is a full price purchase regardless there. And that is going to have some, so you can have secondary impact for these primary strategies. So yes, we do. When we're working with brands, part of it is we're looking at it from how do you gain market share? in that spot how do you get that ranking and so we think through what's going to give you the best chance possible and so if it is various ways that you're going to for any brand to launch a new product get the word out and drive traffic to the website traffic driven from externally to walmart is heavily rewarded they're they're optimized differently than amazon both of them love google traffic for sure. walmart you could argue is more heavily optimized for google than amazon you can see it by the what their criteria are for title length and different things for seo for each listing, I was looking at similar web to see sources of traffic to Walmart. And back in November, 43% of traffic to Walmart site was from desktop search, which is largely Google. And you can also see in how they serve up Google shopping ads for free on their own dime, not on, not on the seller side, as well as organic listings. So they're, they're focusing on those things. So anything you can do that drives traffic to the website, sure. eyeballs, click through, add to cart, conversion, those are all very helpful. And they see usually a higher impact on Walmart than you might see on Amazon because the volumes are still a little right. bit lower. Yeah. You, need, you need less velocity. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so that's big. And doing that in tandem with PPC is helpful. And yeah. so both those would be things we recommend there. Offsite traffic is a great way. But you do have to, to your point of keyword embedded URLs that there is no attribution right now. Uh -huh. There's no native attribution link in Walmart. And so one of the, there is a way you can do a, if you're already on the website and you have to double check to make sure your brand is indexing, the product is indexing for certain keywords. But given that you can basically, the, the manual way to do it is you can create a link by searching that keyword, going into the brand filter, finding your brand or clicking on any brand and replacing the brand it finds with your brand name as you, as you have it in Walmart. And if your listing pops up there, basically you have the pre-embedded, this is the keyword filtered by my brand. I can now drive external traffic to this listing if I want. And that does help. Strategies like that are, are beneficial. Got it. We didn't touch on the on the products categories. What, where, what would you say is like things you've seen not perform as well? And then maybe like best, best categories, best and worst. Yeah. So the worst, the worst product type, I would say, is your really niche or niche, however you say it, uh, a product. So the example I'd give is, is if on Amazon, you found that recyclable bamboo pour over coffee filter is killing it because no one else is in that space, but there's a lot of search volume. The equivalent you're gonna have to compete for volume with on Walmart because it's lower search volume in general is coffee filter. Right. And so if you're a premium price point because you're a premium niche, you're just probably not gonna see the return there. You're not gonna see volume. Right. And you're competing on price. So price, if you're in the mid range of price and honestly, more of the ubiquitous products that may have passed some shelf life on Amazon, cause they're getting hyper competitive there. You might find second life on Walmart right now. Cause that's maybe where the marketplace is in its maturity of, of what people are buying and, and based on volume. So. Yeah. So you're, you're saying, you're saying what, where is it that, that you might do well, not on Amazon, but on Walmart in, in which area? So hyper-competitive products that may be a little oh. bit more commoditized. Right. So coffee filter, dog leash, those things have been classically joked about somewhat in Amazon of, man, this is overly done. Right. Might actually have some life on Walmart because still the name of the game is optimization for keywords and not everybody, people are still sleeping at the wheel. A lot of people that are on the marketplace are there because their listings are created by drop shippers or arbitragers and the brand is not focused there. And so you have the opportunity to do everything you knew to do maybe 2016 or earlier, if you knew to do those things and perform better. So, you know, the top 10 categories by, if it's an indicator by ad spend, whether or not that means there's opportunity or, or over competitive, but you know, Walmart's known as a grocery 
those kind of items. And so if you're thinking, well, they do grocery, so maybe in the grocery space, I can, I can kill it here. You're going to be competing against pickup today in store. That makes it harder to rank. Right. Doesn't, doesn't mean it's impossible, but if you, that's one thing to consider. So consumables I've heard quoted by, by folks in Walmart's marketplace category leaders on that side that supplements at one point accounted for, I think they said 60% of the revenue on walmart.com. Wow. Wow. I haven't seen the data behind that, nor have I seen consumer supplement brands actually performing at that velocity. So I would, knowing what I know, I would, I would probably combine that with, okay, if you're talking maybe vitamin C tablet, right. it's more of a generic kind of thing that, that makes right. sense. But the ultra, ultra top shelf supplement thing, that's going to be harder to do yeah. beauty is going to be harder because you're going you're if you think about the type of product of amazon shoppers tend to shop like if i can imagine it i'll search for it and i can probably find it right and i can get it in two days walmart shoppers if i would characterize it are probably thinking more like if i were to walk into walmart i could go buy it but maybe i can just get it delivered instead so thinking through what would i see on the shelves at walmart right now what is the general price point and quality level so are you I'm saying so are you saying that you would think Walmart has a higher percentage of branded searches than category type searches? They have a lot of branded searches, yes. And you can't conquest brands really on Walmart. Right. They, they have that pretty firmly gated. So if you're thinking you're going to conquest by PPC or just figure out how to put a weighted branded keyword in, right. Walmart favors the primary brand. Yeah, so, so that's a compatible because, with strategy that works sometimes on, yeah. on Amazon. Right. I imagine that's are. because Walmart is sort of first more loyal to its big brands that are in store, right? That's right. And, you know, big brands in store yeah. are going to tell Walmart, hey, like, you know, don't do what Amazon's doing. Amazon has doesn't have that level of in store loyalty, right? So, right. yeah, like anybody can bid on can bid on anything. Walmart has a little bit. Some of those bigger brands, you know, maybe if they're big enough, could you know, yeah. they're 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 currently more important than the online revenue, I guess. And, right. But we, yeah, and we onboarded an aggregator at one point to Walmart. And it was, it was, it was the non-specific niche skews, the broad ubiquitous things like jars for your kitchen and, you know, paper bag, you know, things like that, that are just like, what this, there's no way this would work on, on Amazon. Right. right, now. right. Or the things that, that did better than the niche down stuff. Right. And, and I, I could speak for our brand. I mean, we, we, we sell in sports and outdoors an extremely ubiquitous product, right? You know what product it is, Leron, because right. you, we just onboarded with Incrementum this morning. Actually, the, the timing of this call is really funny. And we, we've kind of been sucking at our ads management internally on Amazon. So we hired Incrementum. We, we, we're sitting at like 20%, 21% tacos right now on Amazon. And we're trying to get that down. Right. But on, on Walmart, now it's only 7.2% of our sales on Amazon, but our tacos is only 12%. And, you know, the interesting thing is I'm competing with an in-store offering that's half my product's cost. And I'm also competing with a bunch of other guys that are, I'm 30, 40% higher than, and we're still selling enough to make it worth our time for sure. Why do you think, why do you think that is just the way you're positioning listing quality, that those things yep. that you're doing better than the. Sort yep. of so Walmart, we upload uh, a bunch of reviews team? from our website. So we, we dominate on the review right. front, we right. dominate on the content front because Lou rises is, is handling all that and, and right. keeping us relevant. And then we're, we're, we're in ad placements that our competitors aren't, aren't well, in. And is it kind of like Amazon where, you know, third-party sellers are doing a better job than let's say Amazon retail listings. And it's kind of the same with Walmart retail, like one P side where your, your listing is going to look a lot better if you know what you're doing, right? Like your listing is going to look a lot better. And I mean, that's true, right, Ryan, from what you've seen. And we, we do yeah. service some one P clients, actually a decent number of them. Yeah. Probably, probably half of our, our clients are one P I would say, I would say it depends, but yes, there's a lot, the whole omni-channel push is you have a lot of incumbent kind of retail brands that have been in store that are still scratching their heads of figuring out why should I care about e-commerce? My right. model is all around retail. Right. Meanwhile, Walmart knows, and they've done studies already internally to show that Walmart shoppers, specifically in food and beverage, they had one study, Walmart Connect, their ad side did a study last year of Walmart shoppers. They were in food and beverage shopping. 82% of them used the app at least a couple of times while they were shopping in store. 
And so Walmart knows online, online presence scales, retail purchase, those kind of things. And so Walmart's focused on it. There's a lagging right. group look, of retail the, brands that just reviews. aren't focusing on it. They're looking at the yeah. reviews. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're looking at price or maybe there's another product. Can I get a better price? And so they, they want to do that. There's a lot of, I, I've been in a line of review where trying to convince the supplier, they need to focus more on retail and or more, more on e-commerce as a retail supplier. And it was, it's, it's, it's a, it's a whole new exercise for them to get their head around it. So it is a disruption opportunity. Right. If you are optimized better, if you're doing these things and, and focusing on them, there's opportunity. The other thing that even if there are brands that maybe are not national level brands, but they're brands in certain categories that are in store, it doesn't mean you can't compete with them because they may be only in out of, you know, 4,000 stores, whatever it is, they may be in 400, 600 stores, and they're going to only show up for a 1P offering if the store can fulfill it for pickup. They might not be an e-commerce distribution. So you may get the rest of the country. They may just be in Southeast region and you're gonna show up everywhere else right. in position one. So there's there's those things to factor in too. But yeah, Walmart's still trying to figure out this. How do we balance our in-store retail, which we've got to care about right. and not dilute that shopping cart of people buying from retail? And how do we accommodate for third-party marketplace? marketplace sellers they're, they're going back and forth and trying to really figure it out but they're sending the right signals on the ad side but the, but the, mentioned... the you think that part of the future is potentially pick up in store anyway partly right. they'll, they'll continue to figure out those kind of options and how do they how do they leverage delivery i don't know if every third party seller is going to be able to do pick up in store kind of those things down the road right but a lot of it that's been where they've seen their largest growth already with in-store offer and they'll i don't have any doubt like one of the reasons when you said why at the beginning, why did we decide Walmart maybe would be right. where we do value added services? We're placing our bet with Walmart that there's a lot of sharp folks that have been running the massive, like number one, re, number one business in the world, you know, and number one retail, at least for a long time. They've got sharp folks that are making some good moves. So on the ad side, you know, they hired Seth Dallaire, who is chief revenue officer now over at Walmart. He was at Instacart before that, was helping build out Amazon global advertising before that. They're running some good plays and doing some good stuff. And it's evolving over time, but. Got it. So, so generally, what is, what does it look like? I mean, I guess in terms of somebody working with you, it could be, they're not on Walmart yet. They're on Amazon. Let, let's say some of the criteria said they're doing seven figures. There's, they're in a category that makes sense. You have kind of a, a way to help them assess if, if they should go on or, or if they're on there already, but is it kind of like any size seller, um, can be a potential fit to work with you? Because I know with agencies sometimes are like with mine, right? We we want to have like a, with mine, generally speaking, we want like a seven figure seller plus, right? Because paying our fees, et cetera, right? With Walmart though, it's a little bit different because you're not going to find as many seven figure sellers, right? Let's say on, on Walmart or or if somebody's seven or let's say they're even eight figure seller on, on Amazon, right? They They may be doing seven figures. On, on Walmart. So what is the typically, who are you typically working with as far as, you know, helping, uh, helping onboard and, and. Yeah. So we would still set the, the general criteria is a good leading indicator of a good potential relationship would be if they're doing seven figures or more on Amazon. Right. Then and they, then on they have, Walmart. They have the cash flow to invest in the growth, right? On Walmart. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so they, they, that's assuming they're doing well with their margin. They've got cash flow. Right. Because, you know, and I'd say ideally 10 SKUs. Uh, or, or so, because you can't just place all your bets on one SKU just because it's your hero SKU on Amazon right. that it's going to do really well. So the broader the SKU count, the better. And the less niche down it is, the better in some ways. There's always some standouts there. So, you know, sports and outdoors, home, kitchen. I could go through a list. We talked about, you know, pets, patio, toys, other things. There's They're competitive, but they, you can you can do well. We look at those criteria and I think it's it really comes down to breadth of SKUs, how, how, how's their price point? That's, it's really price sensitive. Right. So if you're look at, you know, use a tool like Helium 10 or something. And, and while I, I don't necessarily use it for sales volume estimate, search volume is, is pretty good indicator and see, do you find at least four keywords over a thousand searches? Do you find, are you at least within a hundred percent of that average price range on page one, right. ideally at the average price point. If you're up over 100 or 150% of the price point, it's going to be really hard unless right. you have a clear differentiation that makes sense, but you're still going to see a lower volume for yeah. sure. Ryan, you'll uh, run a some, brand yeah. assessment for people yeah. and and sort of say, hey, you know, this we really think this 
these SKUs could be a fit, maybe not these SKUs, or, hey, this is not something you should do right now. We turn a lot of people away just saying, hey, you come back in a year, maybe, right. you know? Right. Or, because hey, I would say, so, like, let's say sometimes maybe we see this. I imagine maybe some people are struggling on Amazon and they're thinking, hey, maybe we'll go to Walmart. And again, maybe that's not like in the ideal scenario to, if you haven't, you know, I don't know, pro proven like a, some success or cash right. flow, then maybe you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't do it. But sometimes people will think maybe another platform is, you know, is the solution where it's, it's probably not, you know, in terms of success. Right. Right. It, it's it's probably not going to yield. I mean, there may be outliers. There's always outliers. Yeah. There are always surprises. But probably the general rule of thumb would be if if it's not succeeding on Amazon because you haven't figured out how to really capture market share or you, you don't know if this product is a product market fit. Maybe you just had a great idea for a product, but the demand wasn't there. The demand isn't necessarily going to be there on Walmart. Likely is not right. going to be there. If you're struggling because you, you launched a Me Too product that had no differentiation, maybe you'll get it there. But again, if you haven't proven serious sales volume in the past, right. you may not even get on the platform. Right. So I would probably advise one of them, hey, try a different product rather than try a different marketplace right. and, and learn, get, get cash flow going on Amazon potentially before we start looking at Walmart as, again, if you're dependent on that short-term ROI, that cash flow from Walmart, it's going to be a much smaller subset of products that are really going to do that well right off the bat. Yeah. Any to kind of end off any predictions? I mean, there have been different rumors or like predictions, you know, maybe Walmart will buy Shopify, you know, they kind of, they kind of partnered with them, right. To, to be able to help people launch or on Shopify right into Walmart. Any predictions in terms of, you know, some, some potential acquisitions or where some things that Walmart will be doing you think in the space or let's say 2023? Mm, that's a good question. I don't know if any acquisitions would be coming in. Their, their MO is usually they'll white label something. Mm -hmm. You know, like this year they rolled out with Ibotta, which is traditionally in the CPG space. You can get rebates. We talked about rebates and how do you mm -hmm. do. Walmart doesn't have coupons because they, they, they advertise themselves as a brand, as a low cost leader. Right. They don't do couponing, but like Ibotta, they... they basically white labeled their software for I think the next five years or so. So if you work with Ibotta, then you can on your listings on Walmart, you can get a rebate checkbox for every purchase. I don't know. I don't know if there's going to be any, I mean, they already have infrastructure and logistics. They're, they're killing it there. I think it's, I'm surprised constantly what they do. I don't know what, what acquisition. They find jet.com, you know. They took, they bought Jet, and people would argue that that was a, a waste of money. Those things, but you know, it was aqua hire in right. the end, whether or not that was original intention or not. But they got a lot of staff there, and whether right. or not those staff stayed on, you could argue it helped over time. I I, I would I would assume they're going to be less likely to do a, a major. Right. I would be shocked if they bought Shopify. I don't see the signals there necessarily. Yeah, I don't have a I don't have a big bold prediction because right. it's yeah, I'd be I'd be shooting from the hip on right. acquisitions. I do think what they'll do is we're going to see more ad, ad, ad placement opportunities. We already have heard, you know, we're going to see things like, you know, negative keywords that get, get rolled out over this next year. We're going to see things like video ads. We're going to see those things start right. increasing. So we'll see more opportunities to compete. So I think we'll see more sell, likely more volume on the site. And the advantage is going to go to those who are taking first mover advantage, if it makes sense for yeah. them. Yeah, and, and my prediction is that that more and more e-commerce brands are going to be prioritized for placement in store. Even even their first call of open, what was it called Ryan? Open call. Open call, which is like, hey, if you have a product idea, come and show it to our buyers. And you know, that guess who got prioritization? Existing Walmart.com 3P sellers. And so they're going to continue to try to let data make some of their purchasing decisions. Right. I think they're going to continue to do more regional buys where it's like, hey, you're doing well on our website compared to the competition, compared maybe even to an existing brand that they have. So we're going to try you in the right. Southeastern US. Or right. if it's and they, have, a, they also have the data on where people are buying from, right? Like, exactly. And yeah. so they're going to do more, they're going to continue to do more of merging the retail and the online in terms of how they make decisions for buying. And so there's 1% of, of SKUs on .com we're seeing get considered by buyers. And, 
And and I think they're going to continue to to follow Amazon's path with how the e-commerce side works. But the part that's kind of interesting is how does the retail side connect in? Right. And they're mm -hmm. continuing to do more and more and more of that. And so that's where we come in is really helping navigate those relationships at Walmart because they're relational, unlike Amazon. And a lot of sellers don't have the capacity to develop right. those relationships and to develop a whole new set or to of really, Or to really say, look, if I'm going to do this, I just need to outsource it because, you know, today 5% of revenue is eh, like there it doesn't right. make sense for me to focus all this time. So exactly. You know, let me just hire it out. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I will make one other prediction, I guess, as I think about it a little bit more, stewing on it. I think that the perception of Walmart, you know, Walmart's been, is a low cost leader. They will always fight for that and always fight for the shopper in that way. But the perception of value of the quality or the, the demographic, those kind of things, I think there's probably going to be continue to be pushes over the next year to heighten that in the eyes of the shopper. So that is that, you know, someone who's who's more interested in luxury or convenience-based shopping, not just low cost. Yeah. I think you're going to continue to see moves that that raises the Walmart brand overall, right, into that marketplace because they see that's where a lot of the disposable income is going to be. Right, and the uh, the low, the most recent evidence of that for me is the Amex Platinum card, mm -hmm. right, the personal one. Guess what's included? A Walmart Plus subscription. Uh -huh. You know, and that's a that's a high income, high credit right. score card right there. Right. And they, you know, Walmart must have reached out or whatever, but there's a deal now for that. Right. And I'm going, okay, they're targeting a right. It's a smart. It's a smart move. Yeah. For Walmart. Great. What 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 are the best ways people can get in touch and talk talk with you about their brand? Yeah, you can go to uh, bluerise.com. It's B L U E R Y S E because every uh, e-commerce agency has to replace their eyes with Y's. I think. <laughs> And then you can go to LinkedIn. I'm LinkedIn. You can you can hit us up there. Reach out to me, Ryan, Ryan King, Blue Rise. You can reach out to us by email. Just connect at bluerise.com. Any one of those ways, we'd be happy to talk to you if it's answering questions or we're also active in, in other communities as well and can answer questions there. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Leron. Wonderful. Thank you, Leron. Thank you.